Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the recap of the season four premiere of Power. Ghost is arrested. Ghost is getting locked up. Of course, Ghost didn't kill Greg, but you killed 20 other people. He should have been locked up a long time ago. He's good at avoiding the cops, hence the name Ghost, but we're not gonna act like this is a stand-up gentleman. This man is a serial killer. I've lost count of how many people he's killed. Ghosts getting locked up like you, you kinda need to be locked up. You kinda deserve to be locked up, all things considered. I mean, and granted, you only kill other people that were in the drug game, right? So. They kind of knew the life they were signing up for when they signed on to be drug dealers. But you're also a drug dealer. Either getting killed or getting locked up is, is part of the job description. So I feel bad for the kid. I, I hurt for them. I feel bad for them. I don't really feel bad for Tasha. You were about this life. You lived the upside of it. You've got the penthouse apartment in the sky. You've got the cars. You've got the jewelry. You've got the clothes. The kid's in private school. But that was never guaranteed to last. You had a long run. I don't have any sympathy. I want him to, to get out is to antagonize Angie because she's just the most arrogant, self-righteous. Oh, she drives me nuts. I just want her to be proved wrong because I don't want Latino Mike to get away with killing Greg. But honestly, I like seeing him in jail because we get to see Charlie Murphy. Rest in peace. I, I, I love that dude. I'm really happy to see him here, but sad to see that someone who brought so much joy to others no longer with us. But Charlie Murphy, he ain't taking no shit. He, he was like, oh, you're a cop killer? I'm gonna I'm a knock your food over. I'm gonna take your mattress. <laughs> did y'all notice how after Ghost found out Charlie Murphy took his mattress, he did a quick moment. He fought the air like Cuba Gooding Jr. and Boys in the Hood. He's, oh. Charlie Murphy ain't holding no cut cards for a cop killer. Tariq, they wrapped that storyline up real quick. At the end of last season, Kanan and his crazy ass cousin played by Nika Noni Rose. I knew Nika Noni Rose had range. I didn't know she had that kind of range. They drugged Tyrese and abducted him and sent a note to Tasha demanding some ransom. So I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, is Tyreek gonna live? Because you know, Kanan killed his own damn son. And I figured once you're comfortable enough to kill your own kid, nobody's really safe. I was very worried about Tyreek. Tasha calls her husband to tell him that Tariq has been abducted. He's not answering the phone because he's getting locked up. So she calls Tommy. Tommy goes to Dre because he knows Dre is tight with Tariq. Dre pops over at Kanan's house and was like, yo, y'all got Tyreek? They agree to let Tyreek go. Kanan, his cousin, and some other dude. They agree to let Tyreek go for $45,000 a week to leave him alone and not bother him again. Which, I don't think all this time I've had a real understanding about the level of drug dealing that Ghost and Tommy are at. Like, how much money is actually being moved. But... Dre is not top of the food chain and he's not distro. $45,000 a week you could just give away. It's not really a hit to your budget. They moving a lot of weight. Apparently I have no knowledge of, of the amount of wealth of drug dealing. I just know Avon and Stringer and then what happened on Narcos and a couple other movies here and there like Blow. But I didn't, I had no idea it was that much money involved. Maybe I should have made different choices in life, but then I'd be faced with ghost situations. So maybe I made the right choices in life. So Dre goes to get Tyreek. He takes him back home to his mother. Tommy's there. Tyreek comes up with some story. Kanan helped coach him. Oh, I, I was drinking. I was some friends. I drank too much and I passed out. And one of my friends thought it would be funny to take this picture and send it to my mom. As, as a mom, I would need to know which one of your friends is that stupid because you can't ever hang out with them again. I need to call his mother and talk to her and tell her how dumb her son is. I, we need to talk about the kids drinking. Like I know it's very common, but we're not going to act like because it's common, it's okay. I'm a little surprised that Tasha and Tommy let that fly. Tommy, eh, he goes back to Dre and he's like, so what's what's the real deal here? Because this story don't, don't really make sense to me. And Dre is like, does it matter? I brought the kid home. No one even said thank you to me, which to credit, somebody should have said thanks, Dre. Mm. Another big suspense solved early on in the episode. Lala lives. Lala, Keisha, call her what she want. I, her name is Lala. But Lala lives. She's alive. Um, Tommy had been stashing her away with looks like the basement of a warehouse. And then she pops over at Tasha's house to be like, hey girl, like, what's up? And Tasha was like, why you, why didn't you call me? Why didn't you tell me where you've been? And Keisha was like, 
man, you're, you're money laundering through my, my legit business. Like I have a child. I was building a future for my child and you put that future in jeopardy. Like, like I'm not really cool with you. And Keisha, bless her heart, actually is a really good friend, a much better friend to Tasha than Tasha is to her. Because Keisha's like, well, hey, girl, what's going on? How can I help? And then she's standing there talking to Tasha. Don't you know the house gets raided? Angela, she really dragged her raggedy ass up in Tasha's house. Like, ma'am, you were sleeping with this woman's husband. And I get it. Tasha is, is married to a drug dealer. But ma'am, you were humping a drug dealer. And you knew you were humping a drug dealer. You don't have any great moral authority over her. You trying to come in the house and being like, Arr. sit your ass down. You have no moral high ground. Just because you're a cop, you think you're special. Don't. Because the other cops that you work with constantly pull your card. I cannot remember that white guy's name for anything. But when him and Mike were sitting in the conference room talking about the case, and Angela came in he told her straight to her face like slow your roll you were having sex with with the victim and the murderer don't don't think that that's not a conflict of interest he pulled her card right quick and she just sat there like you getting called out like that at work it's, it's you're never getting promoted you're never going anywhere on that job like you might as well just ask for a transfer but everybody in the department and everybody in the agency has heard about your shenanigans so it might just be best for you to find a different line of work he shamed her and she needed a reminder because you're acting like you're just above it all and ma'am you just as dirty as everybody else like you played in dirt you got dirty and you liked it i laugh every time angela gets dragged by one of her colleagues you got the nerve to roll up in his wife's house be like well this is his house and he brought this on himself by doing what he did Angela get, get the hell out that house she's just bad shit so ghost calls turtle call him Proctor that's technically his name on the show his, his name is turtle so ghost calls turtle to tell him that he's been arrested turtle was the lawyer so he shows up the next day to see ghost and ghost says that he's been arrested for basically Angie wanting revenge on him for breaking up with her ghost is very adamant he's like I did not do this turtle tells Jamie about the evidence that the prosecution has against him basically there's fingerprints on the outside of a window and he, uh, Greg had Jamie's DNA under his nails. He tells him that it's going to take a while to get him out of jail, but in the meantime, he needs to act like a very upstanding citizen, somebody who wouldn't have no interest in a gun, who wouldn't know what to do with a gun. He's just a business owner who's being wrongly prosecuted. And then after, Turtle calls Tasha and is like, hey, we're going to need to raise some bail money. You need to find $2 million. And Tasha, bless her heart, was like, of clean money? Tasha goes to the bank only to find out that Jamie has taken all the money out. He leaves her a note that says, I'm sorry, Tasha, I'll put it back. Tasha asks about the stocks. He's like, oh, there's, there's no stocks. Your husband took care of that. He screwed himself because Tasha's not the one that needs the money. She's scrambling, trying to find money to get you out of jail. Tasha's having trouble coming up with the money. She's gonna, there's some other things. She was gonna get the money out of the trust fund, but the penalties are too steep. So she's like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how I'm gonna find this money. Tasha, bless her heart, goes to jail the next day and was like, hey, it's, it's a really rough time. You know, I can't find any money because you spent it all without telling me. Like, so you're broke, I'm broke. We have no assets. We don't own the apartment. We don't have any collateral. Like you don't own the building for truth and you, taken all the money that we had saved for events like this and spent it on yourself. Ghost has an idea, call Dean. I don't really remember the backstory with Dean. It was either he gave him the money as a security deposit when he thought Dean was actually doing legit security or he gave him the money when they were trying to get the club deal together with Karen. I can't remember which one, but it was a large sum of money. And so Dean's bosses would have it. And so they would be able to give it back. Tasha and Tommy go smoke a blunt in the car and they have the same trouble figuring out what exactly that story was too. But it comes to them. Tommy takes care of it with his new partner, Pratar, and literally like, the next scene which i guess is the next morning the next night like a check comes for two million dollars so that that that's done ghost has bail money you know who i like on this show i like the new guy the asian cop the john mock dude he's surly as i don't know what and he gives no damn because he went to meet old boy in prison and he was like hey i need you to flip on somebody because you need to get out because your wife is dying and i know you don't want to not see her before she passes and dude was like, so wait, let me understand. I get out of prison and she still dies and I'm now living as a snitch for the rest of my life.
life. And dude, without missing a beat, was like, well, at least you won't miss the funeral. <laughs> I love him. He's a welcome addition to the show. It's the big day and Jamie is finally going to court. I was a little confused when he walked in in a jumpsuit because I kind of felt like they have enough money to get him a good suit. But I don't know the technicalities of legal courtrooms. Like I took the LSAT, but I never went to law school. And apparently I haven't watched as much Law and Order as I think I have because I don't know why Jamie wasn't in a suit. Maybe Tasha just ain't feel like bringing one. Turtle and John Mock, the new lawyer, go back and forth about whether Jamie should be released on his own recognizances. The judge looks like she's leaning toward electronic monitoring slash house arrest, but Mock is like, yo, like we we're talking about a man who he killed an officer, he killed an FBI agent. Like, no, that's, that's not okay. We can't just let him out on the street. And the judge is like, you know what? You make a good point. We need to make an example. Sorry, sir, you're gonna stay in jail. No bail. So Tasha went through all that for nothing. At least she really knows how the finances are standing right now. And to be quite frank, they're f***ed up. Like Jamie took all the money for his selfish purposes and then got his ass locked up. So I'll tell you, there was one scene when I felt bad for Tasha. She goes to court. Her husband doesn't get out of jail. She gets home. She takes off her shoes, drops her purse. The camera pans around and you see what she's facing. Her house is a wreck. The FBI ripped her house to shreds. I felt that. Her life, you kind of know there's a possibility of getting arrested. You know there's a possibility that the money goes away. But I don't know if people think about like those little moments that come with the downfall of a drug organization. The women are left behind to deal with it all by themselves. And I think in theory that that sounds like one thing, but in reality, it looks like another. You're literally there to pick up the pieces. It's not just figurative, it's not a metaphor. You literally have to put everything back together. Dre meets up with Kanan to give him his first payment to stay away from Tyreek. Dre isn't even in the car to leave yet. And he texts Tyreek to be like, hey, what's good? And Tyreek was like, I don't know. I'm trying to figure out when I can see you again. This relationship is very, like you killed your own son. And so you kind of want to take somebody else's and who better than your arch nemesis. But this is just a strange, strange relationship. But. That's my recap. Let me know what you thought of the first episode. Let me know if you feel sorry for Ghost. Let me know if you hate Angie as much as I do. I'll be recapping the whole season. So tune in next week and the week after that. And please subscribe. I need to get my numbers up so I can get into YouTube studios. The girl got goals in life. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.